Kids are dismissed. Well, good morning. Wow. general principles, maybe not take every verse, um, try to expound the meaning. I think there's a good flow to verses 1 through 11. I would like to take that entire section this morning. I'm going to go ahead and re read that. It's page uh, 1035 if you're using the Bible and you see in front of you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer to the lust of men, but for the will of God, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this... They are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has, for this purpose, been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, whoever speaks is to do it as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do it as the one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Father, we ask as we open your word this morning that your blessing would be upon it as the Spirit of God moves in our minds to enlighten us to the, the truth of these passages, as he moves in our hearts to apply it to our own personal lives, uh, to see where exactly we are in relation to these various subjects. And Lord, we just pray for conviction and passion to be reignited as we search your scriptures together this morning. And Lord, for the needs of your people here to be met, we ask it in Christ's name. So in this series, we've been looking at resilient living in a hostile world. Now that is something that the apostles really demonstrate to us. I think of the Apostle Paul particularly, who gives a list of the things that he endured in this hostile world, and yet amazingly was resilient and continued to, to focus on God's will in his life. I was thinking specifically of a situation in Acts chapter 14, where Paul was in Lystra, and because of the persecution, uh, he was stoned and dragged out of the city, said, assuming that he was dead. And uh, that uh, guesstimation by the, the people that he was dead may have, in fact, been true. You know, when a person is stoned, I don't know if you know much about stoning, but they don't throw pebbles, okay? We're talking <laughs> big, big rocks. It's a brutal uh, way to die. And... Uh, Paul gives a list of many things that he endured, but that's probably one of the more severe things he endured, was a stoning probably to death. And the reason I say that is because when he was dragged out of the city, his lifeless body, it says that he got up and kind of brushed it off. Now, you don't do that unless there's something miraculous going on. Now, whether or not he was uh, being revived, that he was just very close to death, or whether he had actually died, or very well may be when he got that glimpse of the third heavens that he talks about later, that God gave him a glimpse of things that were, were too marvelous for him to even utter. That may have been the time when that happened. I don't know. But what's interesting about that situation is that he felt the full hostility of the world and wanted to snuff out his life, and yet he continued the work of God. He, he encouraged the people in that very city, and after this event occurred, 
by saying, uh, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. So Paul's exhorting these people, continue in the faith, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Paul says you're going to experience the hostility of this world. It's just the path that we're, we're on as God's people. We've been talking a lot about that. There's so many passages that tell us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. Jesus said, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. The Bible says that it's been given unto us not only to believe on Christ, but to suffer for his name's sake. There's a lot of passages on identifying with the suffering of Jesus Christ. And I think as Christians, we, we say we're good with that until it actually happens. And that changes things just a little bit. You know, suffering gives us pause. We understand that we don't like suffering, and we tend to avoid the things we don't like. So just imagine for a moment when Paul stood up after being stoned, he was at a crossroad, the same crossroad we find ourselves at every time we suffer. He could have stood up and said, boy, I really don't like being stoned. Uh, I think I'm going to avoid the city. In fact, I may have to just kind of uh, slow down with this preaching the gospel thing because it's getting me hurt so much. But what did he do? He says he stood up and he walked right back into that city, the very place where he had been stoned. Because he understood his mission there. He understood God's people were there. And God wasn't done working through him uh, in that place. It was a powerful choice. And Peter, who's writing this epistle that we're looking at this morning, he understands the questions uh, that suffering raises. Peter was one who found it easy to say to Jesus, Lord, I'm, I'll never forsake you. Though I'll forsake you, I won't. In fact, I will die with you. That was his proclamation of loyalty. It's easy to make a proclamation like that. But the night that Jesus was taken, it says that Peter was following him at a distance. And when the time came to identify with Jesus, he failed miserably. He denied him in the violent sense possible. See, that's another path of suffering. The person follows Jesus at a safe distance. And that way you're insulated should the heat ever be turned up that we have the option at that point to pull back a little further if necessary. Well, Peter ultimately didn't quit, as you know. He was restored. Later, he refused to repeat his blunder. And he stood many times with Christ, uh, even at the expense of severe persecution. But many people, under the weight of suffering, wilt and never really recover from that. And Paul had a, a lot of ministry associates who traveled with him, who he said, they've left me. They've all forsaken me. Talk about uh, Demas, for instance. He's forsaken me, having, having loved this present world. He couldn't make his ties with, uh, couldn't break his ties with the world. And so Demas de departed. And really what we're looking at here in 1 Peter is Peter's understanding of how people respond to suffering, that there are various courses we can take. That suffering can cause some to go back to a life of sin and self-indulgence. Again, we don't like to suffer, and when we suffer for the cause of Christ, we come to the realization, you know, it would be easier if I wasn't making a stand for Christ. And so we just kind of drift backwards, you know, go, go the path of least resistance. Blend back into the world so we don't stand out so much. Don't have that persecution coming at us. For the, the suffering can lead to sin and self-indulgence. But on the contrary, it can also lead to sanctity and service. And that's what he's encouraging here in chapter 4. He already said back in chapter 3, verse 21, he's reminding them of the fact that they had made a pledge at their baptism. That they would publicly follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They wouldn't go the path of sin. They would have their love and loyalty fixed on Christ no matter what. And so he's encouraging them. Don't, he's saying, don't forget about that. You made a pledge. And so now he's going to address some of the issues related to our response to suffering. And the first of which, and I've lumped these together because it's a large section. And I'll try to get through them fairly quickly. Time and trajectory. This is verses 1 through 6. I'll just go there to verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. The word time is mentioned numerous times in this chapter. You know, one of the things that often changes when we suffer is our kind of perspective of time itself. I don't know about you, but when we went through the lockdowns with COVID, time changed somehow, you know, because we were doing things differently with our time than we were used to doing. In most cases, we were just sitting at home, doing very little, just passing the time. And there are many people who've come out of that, and, and even though we no longer have the mandates, there are a lot of people who find it very difficult now to leave their homes, to be in public settings. It's almost like this little P PTSD thing that, that's occurred over a period of a year of, of sitting in their own homes. They got very comfortable, and you, you kind of retreat into this comfort, and then people begin to count days rather than making days count. They start killing time. David Henry Thoreau says you can't kill time without injuring eternity. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, um, Let's see if that's the right, there it is. So be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but like wise people, make good use of every opportunity you have because the days are evil. Don't be fools then, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. And in some translations, it says uh, redeeming the time. And so you have this idea of time and opportunity being interchangeable because in reality they are. Time is opportunity. It was philosopher William James who affirmed that the best use of a life is to spend it for something that outlasts us. The life's value isn't in its duration, but in its donation. It's not how long we live, but how fully and how well we live as God's people. How well we use the time. And that's why even Moses in Psalm 90 said to the Lord, teach us to number our days. Help us to use the time that we have because we don't have much of it. So Peter sees the potential of suffering Christians losing sight of time's value. You notice there in verse 3, for the time already uh, the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. He's saying there. Don't go back to wasting your life and wasting your time. That was your past. Your, all your time was spent in these activities. But you don't need to go back to that just because life has gotten difficult. Don't give sin the same time as you once did. In fact, he says there in verse 1, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he was suffered in the flesh as cease from sin. And when it says with the same purpose, some translations translate that the same mind. And, and I believe that's the idea, that Jesus had a certain mindset towards sin. And what was that mindset? It was militant, right? I mean, he came to, to battle sin, to die for our sin. At the very least, as we consider the options of a sinful life, just remember that that sin that you're about to indulge in, should you indulge in, that is the very sin that hurt Jesus on the cross. Never mind what it's going to do to you, it's going to hurt your life. But think of how that sin injured him. Have the same mindset as, as Christ. The idea there of, of those who have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin is the idea that sometimes suffering can bring us purity, can purify the life. Help us to Get rid of that superfluous stuff. It doesn't need to be there. And then he calls for a change in trajectory. <clears throat> he says, not in verse 2, not to live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, but for the will of God. Think of the implications. What it means for us as God's people that we can do the will of God. I mean, we take for granted because we've heard that all of our lives. In church, that you can find God's will for your life. But how significant is that? Jesus said in Matthew 11, 
Say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is what? Easy. Easy. And my burden is light. See, everybody thinks that God's will is going to be some heavy thing that God's going to dump on you, so they're afraid to ask for God's will. <clears throat> but God's word, or excuse me, God's will is not a burden, it's a blessing. It said that the two greatest days of your life will be the day you're born and the day you understand what you were born for. Mm -hmm. Not everybody gets to experience that second one. They, they go through life not really knowing what their purpose is. Only as a child of God do you have access to the God who created you and who is able to communicate to you why you were created. He points out that the world isn't going to understand should you choose this trajectory in life? We just gave a list in verse 3. You know, sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. So in verse 4, that in all this, they, that's the world, are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. You know, when a person chooses a path of sin, the world understands that just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're carousing and drunkenness lose, you know, causes you to lose your job, infidelity causes you to lose your marriage, if these sins are in your life and they're destroying your life, the world looks at that and it's like, that's no big deal. Because they see it everywhere. In fact, half the movies out there that are made have those elements in there and nobody's surprised by it. It's the way of the world. But should you show them a path of righteousness, then suddenly you're eccentric, and not in a good way. And, and maybe on a further uh, scale, you may be considered some religious extremist. It says they will malign you. They will speak evil of you just for doing the right thing, because they don't understand it. We've already addressed that back in chapter 3 and chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 12, being the, the goal Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's the goal. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that goal in a moment. Verse 6 of chapter 4 is the example of the martyrs who were judged on a human level in the flesh, says that the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Again, I believe that is a reference to those who have died uh, as martyrs for their faith, persecuted, tried in human courts, but ultimately acceptable to God because they did God's will. In other words, they weren't here to please man, they were here to please God. It doesn't matter what the world thinks about us, when we follow the will of God, all that matters is that we're pleasing the one who has called us. So he addresses the time and trajectory. Next, the purpose and the passion. Verse 7. For the end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. I read verse 9 to be hospitable to one another without complaint. <clears throat> we return to this concept of time for just a moment. Verse 7, the end of all things is near. Time is running out. Not just in our own personal lives. You know, we tend to be very uh, you know, myopic and, and introspective sometimes when it comes to the, you know, the concept of time. But beyond us, we're looking at the bigger program of God. The time is short. The end is near. Look in 2 Peter. Just flip a few pages to 2 Peter 3 for a moment. This is what we're going to be up against when it comes to this doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Have you ever heard someone say that? Oh, you Christians always talk about the end being near. It's been 2,000 years. 
I've heard Christians say that Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime. He hasn't come back for thousands of years. Why would he come back while I'm going? What does it mean in 1 Peter 4 when it says the end of all things is near? Well, we have to understand that God is gauging time not by minutes on a clock, but in relation to the activities of his son. And so you have the first advent, the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. The first coming was the beginning of the end. And anything sandwiched between the first and second coming of Christ is considered the end times because it's kind of the final chapter of human history. Someday to be replaced by uh, a new uh, sovereign, Jesus Christ, and when he establishes his kingdom, then it's no longer the days of man, it's, it's his day to rule. But we're in the end times. It's like the final chapter of a book. You may get to that final chapter, and it may be a long chapter, and you're reading it, it's like, I thought it was near the end. There's still a lot left to go. We've been in a kind of a 2,000-year-long final chapter, if you will. That doesn't mean we're not near the end. The Bible closes with this in Revelation. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. The Bible ends with a reminder of Christ's imminent return. Since the days of the apostles, every generation has been expected to have a view to the imminency of Christ's return, meaning he could come back any time for his bride. There's a lot of description in the Bible about what the end times will look like. Let me ask you this question. As you understand the description of the end times, do you agree that we're getting closer? Right? It's amazing just in the last couple decades how much we've progressed in our uh, in, in the biblical prophecy. It's, it's being fulfilled before our very eyes. The closer we get to the end, the darker the world becomes, the more dangerous it becomes, and the more necessary it is that we stay alert. Is this cutting in and out a lot? A little bit. Is that distracting? Because I can use a different mic. It's all right. It's, it's okay? All right. Man, i got to find where I was at. Dang, I this is my writing. I don't know if you can see from there. It's microscopic, okay? Wow. New eyes. Honestly, I have no idea where I'm at. I've absolutely no idea. Verse 7 there, because the, the end of all things is near, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So because the times in which we, we're living are so dark and dangerous, it's, it's important that we're alert. You know, if you're, you're walking down a dark alley, I bet you're a lot more alert. You know, in the middle of the night, I bet you're a lot more alert and aware than you would be if you were walking down that alley during the day. And as things get darker and darker, we should have this urgency about the need to, to have our eyes open. And this is another lesson that Peter learned uh, through making a mistake. He learned a lot, of his, a lot of his lessons by making mistakes. But you remember the night when he was in the garden with Jesus before the cross, and Jesus was under the strain of knowing what he was facing as he looked to bear the wrath of his, of his father. And he asked his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, to come and pray with him in the garden. But you remember... What he said to his disciples, and Peter specifically, watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. What were they doing? They were sleeping. That was a very dark moment in human history. You know, around the cross, satanic activity was very high. And, and Jesus even said to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. There's going to be some satanic activity in your life, Peter. You need to be prayerful. In chapter 5, verse 8, he repeats this, this call for urgency. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And he knows because Satan had come after him. So what is it that he encourages? Not just that we see the danger, but that we do what? That we pray. The purpose of prayer. And I think it has to be purpose. 
Good prayer life doesn't happen by accident. And I'll ask you this question. It's intrusive. It's probing. But just answer this to yourself. When you look back over yesterday, that whole day, how often did you pray? How much did you pray? It's a good question. You say, okay, well, yesterday wasn't a very good day for me, so let's go back a little further. <laughs> well, what about last week? How many days did you talk to God? And I don't mean that little popcorn prayer before you eat your food. I think if we polled a lot of Christians to find out how much they pray, we find that many Christians, that's all the prayer they do in the day is just when they thank God for the food that they're about to eat, which maybe adds up to about a minute a day. You know, if you pray one minute every day, you've prayed six hours over the course of a year. You spend more time than that brushing your teeth. In fact, there are many people who will spend six hours in a day on their devices and watching television. It takes us a year to get six hours in. Now, I'm not saying your prayer life is that bad. That's kind of worst case scenario there. But I don't think we're as prayerful as we ought to be. I'll squeeze this in because my wife reminds me every Sunday and I keep forgetting. Remind them that we pray Sunday morning, 930 out there in the fort. Nice. There are people that meet and it's it dropped off a bit with the, the attendance of that. But I would encourage you. So find times that you can pray, not only for yourself, but with other people. There's a good opportunity. 9.30 at the church. See, we're in a time-oriented society. Somehow we think that we don't have time to pray. We're too busy to pray. Look at what he addresses, as well as this purpose of prayer. Above all, keeping fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. He takes this a little bit deeper. Above all, this is the most important thing, and then he gets right to the heart of the matter, which is love. Do you remember when you got saved? Are you capable of thinking that far back to that time in your life where you were a new believer and it was exciting? And I will bet that your prayer life then is better than it is now. I'm just going to bet that that's probably the case. And the reason for that, if you were like me back when God got a hold of my life, is that I... I remember spending months and months praying and just being in the state of marvel that I am talking to the one who created me. I'm talking to the God who created everything. And to think that he had a personal interest in my life and that he would talk back and we would have communion together was just so amazing to me. But it's very easy for that fire to begin to wane. And the flames of passion are very hard to keep stoked in our lives. But that's exactly what he's encouraging here. And we know the seven churches in the book of Revelation, which have broader implications than the churches themselves. They really represented ages that have occurred within the last 2,000 years, the condition of the church progressively throughout. And it starts with the church of Ephesus. And there's a lot of good things said to the church of Ephesus by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. The church of Ephesus continued to serve God. They were faithful. They were loyal. But it got to a point where they were just going through the motions, and they had, the heart really wasn't in it. God says, you've left your first love. And you know where that, you track that. The condition of the church is you read the other six churches that are mentioned there, and they perfectly align with the situation or the condition of the church in the last 2,000 years. We end up with the church of Laodicea. So this is the first. The church of the, La of the Laodiceans is the last, which represents the age in which we live. And how is this church defined? Lukewarm. God says, you're neither hot nor cold. I will spew you out of my mouth. How did we get to this place? It goes back to this. In Ephesians, or excuse me, the, the church of Ephesus. They lost their first love. And if you don't tend to that and have that love and passion restored, it will lead to a lukewarm <clears throat> situation. When he says here in um, verse 8, to keep fervent in your love, the word fervent means strenuously, and it gives us a word picture of a horse that is at full gallop. That's the idea of the word fervent. Or 
an athlete who is straining and stretching his muscles to win a race. In other words, give it all you got. But notice here, it isn't just calling upon us to love God, but to love him by loving his people, to love one another. Christians have often been described as a bunch of porcupines out in the cold. We suffer, we're out in the cold, we're suffering, and we just want to get with other Christians, huddle together for some warmth, but we inevitably start to prick one another when we do. It can be an uncomfortable situation. I'll make you aware of movements that are happening right now where there's, there's calls that are going out to Christians to, to leave organized religion. Now I understand organized religion can cover a lot of things, and there's some false organized religion. But at the heart of that call is for people to get away from church. You know, get out of those places where all the hypocrites are. But I work for you, that it's in the church where the Christians are. Some of them may be hypocrites, some of them not, but that's where they are, because the church has been organized by Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he has even given us a dictate that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so this idea that's floating out there that you don't need church to be a good Christian. You just stay in the comfort of your home. That's what live streams for. That's what YouTube's for. You can do your Christian life in the comfort of, of your own home from your couch. But that is not the picture we have of the church in the New Testament. It is a body of people who get together. And one of the reasons a lot of people don't like church is because they don't like being pricked. Because when you get with other sinners, inevitably, someone's going to rub you the wrong way. Someone's going to offend you. And the attitude so often is, well, that person offended me. I'm not going to associate with that person anymore. Well, thank God he doesn't say that about you when you sin against him. In fact, we're told in Colossians 3, bear with one another, forgive one another. If any has a grievance against someone... Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And that ends any debate about whether we should forgive one another. If God was willing to do it for you, you have no right to withhold forgiveness from someone else. And yet that's what's keeping a lot of churches from growing. There's infighting. There's people who have issues with one another. But this addresses that prickling problem that's occurring in churches is that we just forgive one another. We don't hold it against one another. He goes a step further here in verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Now, hospitality is a very overt act of love in that you're, you're basically opening your life up to other people in a very tangible way. I thought it interesting that Albania is a place known for its hospitality. It's part of their culture that every Albanian family, no matter how poor they are, will have a secret stash of supplies and food for the occasion where they might have opportunity to entertain a stranger. Isn't that interesting? They reserve good things on the side that they hide away just so they can be hospitable to a stranger. And their motto there is, an Albanian house belongs to God and his guests. It's like an open door policy. The problem with hospitality is that when we're in a place of suffering, it's really hard to extend hospitality. You're like, how can I extend to others what you know, I can't even do for myself? And that brings us to the, the third and final thought that has to do with service for one another. And so we've gone here from the head from the mind, to the heart, and the passions, now to the hands, to the service. Verses 10 and 11. As each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do it as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do it as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, when you're suffering, it's very hard to think about serving other people. Because suffering makes us very self-centered. 
sometimes. We get very introspective. It's all about me and this hardship that I'm enduring. And we have very little capacity to look outside of ourselves. But I believe it's one of the greatest keys to overcoming suffering is to begin serving other people. Have you ever had a really bad day and then you have opportunity to do something kind for someone else and that lifts your spirit, lifts your mood? There's a reason for that. There's joy in service. It gets us off ourselves, thinking about others. And this, the, the excuse really doesn't hold up. Well, I don't have any energy left. My life is so hard, I don't have time or energy left for anyone else but me and my family. Well, he just said there in verse 11 that when you're serving, you're supposed to do it with the strength that God supplies. So are you saying that there's not enough strength available to you to serve? If so, then that means you're not really depending on his strength to do the serving. Didn't he say, my strength is made perfect in weakness? What's at stake here? Well, verse 11, I just read it, the glory of God, that he may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So he introduces in verse 10 here this idea of stewardship, the word to be stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, a moment ago, we talked about time. We're stewards of time. But being a steward of time and being a steward of grace are a little different because grace, unlike time, it, it, there are no natural laws attached. So in other words, time has a fixed supply. You can't add to it or take from it. It is what it is because of the natural laws that we live under. But the grace of God is not attached to natural laws. It is infinite in its supply. There is no limit to how much of God's grace you can experience and how much of it you can express to others. And you notice the description of his grace. It's manifold. The idea of manifold literally is multicolored. That's the idea. The multicolored grace of God. So God, this is, this is how it looks. God has given various gifts to the church. There's quite a number of gifts that he's given. They fall within a certain number of categories. But consider this. For the history of the church, for 2,000 years, no two gifts have ever been exactly alike from person to person. You may have this, a gift in the same category as someone else, but your gift is going to look entirely different because you're an entirely different per a person with entirely different circumstances. No two gifts are exactly alike. It's kind of like colors. Do you know how many different colors there are? Take a guess. So the, the, here's the number they give. I don't know how they come to this conclusion, but there are 18 decillion varieties of colors. That is an 18 followed by 33 zeros. That's how many colors there are that we know of in the universe. Now, of course, our eyes are limited. We can only see about 10 million of those colors. But that's still a lot of different colors. Let's put this in perspective of our gifts. As we use our gifts, God's grace coming through us, it's, it's kind of like the sun shining down on us. You know, you have all these variegated colors that begin to come out as God's grace is being expressed through his people. It's interesting to me that when the, the Bible describes the Lord in heaven sitting upon his throne of grace, that it is a rainbow encircled throne. You have the beauty of his glory shining forth from his throne and it creates this beautiful uh, variegated rainbow around his throne. The church is like a prism, not prison, prism <laughs> with an M. God's great grace comes into the church and then becomes fragmented by all through the various lives that, that live in, and work in that church. And the sum total of that light that is projected from our lives, representing various colors of his grace, that, that's the glimpse that we get of God's glory. So our job is to allow the grace of God to come down and work through us. And if we're not using the specific gift that God has given us, then essentially what's happened is God's grace has come to us, but it's never gone through us. It's never reached its intended end, which is others. Just think about that for a moment. If you withhold the use of the gift that God has given you, and we all have at least one gift, the Bible says, 
Some have many. But if we withhold the use of those gifts, that's one less color on display of the glory of God. We don't inhibit the glory of God itself, but the display of it, we can. It's tantamount to taking God's grace and hoarding it, refusing to let it do what it's supposed to do. Can you imagine a company, a very wealthy company, going to a marketing agency and saying, I've got a hundred million dollars here that we want to give you to do a very diverse advertising campaign for our company. I mean, we want our product showcased everywhere. We want it on social media, and television, radio, billboards, and flyers, and football stadiums, you name it. We want it everywhere. And six months later, that company comes back to that marketing firm and says, hey, so what are you doing with our money? What have you done with our money? And their response is, well, honestly, we haven't done anything. In fact, we don't, we don't expect to. We're, we're, we're not going to use it to advertise. We're just going to keep it for ourselves. And your response to that would be, that's not fair. And you took that money to do a job with it, to advertise for that company. You can't hold it. But that's exactly what people do with the grace of God. They receive it into their lives, but they never allow it to go through them to others as God has intended for the very purpose of advertising his glory. Amen. Well, in conclusion, he's addressed the, the head to adjust to the mind of Christ with a deliberate intention to renounce sin in our lives and to embrace God's will. Then he addressed the heart, keep the fires of love and passion stoked, to keep the heart connected to God in prayer, and then finally the hands. Understanding the stewardship of grace and how that grace is meant to extend through you to others through the use of your spiritual gifts, which are meant to function within a local body, a church. And so I would just ask, how are you doing with the suffering that you've endured? I realize there have been degrees of suffering over the last few years. And on top of some of the general suffering, there are some of you here who have lost friends and loved ones, you've experienced deep grief. You've had tremendous hardship. Some of you have gotten very sick, very ill. But what has that suffering driven you to? Has it driven you to draw inwards, become more introspective? Or have you taken that as an opportunity, a springboard to decide, I'm going to do God's will, no matter how, hard, how bad I suffer in this life, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to serve others. There's such a joy and living beyond yourself. But that's a crossroad you're going to come to every time you suffer. Do I start living for myself? Do I draw back? Or just disappear back into the world? Take the easy path? Or do I do the hard thing? Let me just tell you, there is eternal reward for those who choose the hard thing. Father, we just thank you again today for your word and the challenge to us. I know there's a lot in those passages I didn't touch, Lord. But just to be challenged uh, in, the, in the path of suffering, Lord, we, we can get very entitled when we suffer and feel like we, one, we don't deserve the suffering, and two, because of the suffering, we deserve an easier time, an easier life going forward. And we deserve more comforts. Maybe we sit back in our service feeling like we've already done that, we've already made our contributions to your church. Whatever it may be, Lord, uh, we, are, we are all pros at making excuses. And I pray, Father, that we would be people who heed the challenge of this, like the Apostle Paul, who got stoned and then got up and walked right back into the sea. That we would take our lumps for Christ and then just get up and keep going forward for Him. And I just thank you for this group of people, Lord, because there are many in here today that I've been blessed by who, through their suffering, Lord, they've continued, and some for longer than others, but it's just so inspiring to know uh, that their love and their, their passion is at a place where, Lord, they continue even when the going gets tough. And I just pray, Father, that we would all be those people. That we wouldn't become like Demas, who retreats back into the world just because it's more comfortable. We just thank you, Lord, for the time you've given us to do your will. Help us to use that time wisely. Help us not to let sin have victory in our lives. 
to waste our time and indulging, Lord, in those uh, very selfish desires. Thank you again, Father, for your victory in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we close, I want to um, announce uh, two new members to, uh, that have gone through the, the, the class as well as been interviewed by uh, certain of the elders and invite. Okay, well, just two for now, and then we've got another one uh, coming up soon. But Maggie and Annie, would you guys come forward for a minute? Cool. Um, I'm going to have you guys come forward. We do this as we uh, invite new people into membership. We do have more to come. Um, and I'll, uh, we've got <laughs> Allie, who is uh, going to be baptized shortly, and then she's going to be welcomed into membership as well. But she's been through the class. Um, and we also have some other baptisms coming up, I believe, as well, and I'll share more about that later. But these two young ladies, I want to just say a, a word to, I don't know how many of you uh, know what these girls do here at the church, but they have done a lot of do. Uh, aside from helping with the videoing every Sunday morning, these girls are actively involved in helping with children's church and the teaching ministry. They help in Awana uh, with the teaching ministry there, if necessary, as well as leading some songs. They lead worship uh, for the 412. Um, they just both have a heart to serve Christ, mm -hmm. and, um, and Maggie's been uh, leading Lighthouse at the high school this year as well. Um, Addie, by the way, has gotten an extreme hunger for God's Word. She, you read through the entire Bible recently, didn't wow. you? Wow. How many of you have read through the entire Bible? Well, Addie has, so <laughs> let that be a challenge to you. Uh, but just, you know, seeing that heart and desire for Christ has been such a blessing, and they're young. I, I know we don't always receive people into membership at this young age, but... Um, these are two young ladies that definitely, they're already a part of the church. They're already members in that sense. And um, just like today to make it official. Um, All right. So thank you girls. And if um, we're, try, we're trying to, as a board, we've been talking about this with taking a vote. This isn't really officially a business meeting because we have to give you a week's notice for that. I know we've taken a vote in the past. We were looking at that. I don't think the constitution requires us to take a vote. It's kind of a little bit clunky to try to take a vote on people. You've entrusted us as elders to make the determination if people are qualified, if they've been through the class, they've been interviewed, we know they're the children of God and have a strong Christian life. And so um, those who've met with them and interviewed them were very impressed. And so we would like to have everyone stand together. Um, I'm gonna um, just put my hand on the shoulders of these two. And if you would extend your hand forward, I think this is a big deal when we make someone a member, because what it is, is it's an expression of a mutual commitment. They are expressing the commitment to be faithful to the church, but we as a church, are we're expressing our commitment to be faithful to them and to meet their needs. So, ladies, let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Maggie and Addie and their testimony. Uh, even at such a young age, they have a passion to want to serve you, Lord, and, and wherever that service is required, Lord, they are willing servants. They have a passion and a zeal right now that's so inspirational to me and to others, Lord. And I just pray for them that as they join the church, we know uh, they have an enemy to their soul who's going to try to discourage them, Lord, for making these moves forward. And I pray you push back satanic resistance and help them, Lord, to be uh, able to overcome in the, the temptations that will come their way. But, Lord, we ask that we as a church will come alongside them and help them understanding their needs as young people, Lord, to be encouraged and built up and taught and trained in the ministries, Lord, that they're presently active in. Make, make them uh, tremendous, amazing teachers, Lord. They're already very talented, but develop and cultivate that skill. And we pray the same with their music talents that they share with the church. Just help that music, Lord, uh, that leadership to draw people's hearts into worship and uh, deeper reverence to you, Lord. Just thank you again for these two young ladies. And uh, as we close this service today, I pray that the right hand fellowship would be extended to them as we celebrate the fact that they're officially uh, members of our church here today. And we thank you Amen. and praise you again in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, ladies. Well, as I said, if you would extend a, just a friendly handshake to them, invite them. To come. We would really appreciate that. Lord bless you guys. See you next week. <laughs>